Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Do we have to lose touch with our loved ones when they die? Is there really evidence that souls who have crossed over communicate with this world on a regular basis? Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Our guest today, Bill Guggenheim, is a pioneer in the field of after-death communication, ADC experiences. He has been called the father of ADC research and has written and spoken on the subject for more than 27 years. He became a bereaved father when his younger daughter, Janet, age 47, ended her physical life in April of 2011. Bill and his former wife, Judy Guggenheim, founded, defined, researched, and named an entirely new field of human experience, that may be as old as mankind. They call it After Death Communication and publish their findings in their best-selling book, Hello from Heaven. Bill and Judy conservatively estimate that at least 60 million Americans, one out of five people, have had an ADC, though the actual numbers may be closer to double these figures. Bill presents ADC workshops at conferences, local chapters of bereavement support groups, hospices, churches, colleges, bookstores, and many other types of institutions, and we'll be doing uh, an abridged workshop at the upcoming IONS conference in Orlando in July. His ADC research and his book, Hello from Heaven, have been featured on television, including 2020 on ABC, and radio, including Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie, uh, twice, and in numerous newspapers and magazines throughout the United States and Canada, Hello from Heaven has been published in 18 foreign editions and continues to attract readers around the world. Bill, welcome to NDE Radio. Pleasure to be here with you, Lee. Uh, It's good to have you, Bill. Uh, Bill, the story of how you and Judy got interested in the study of after-death communications is is really fascinating. It involves Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Raymond Moody, and, and all of that's in your book. But sadly, since we're limited to only a half hour, I'm hoping we can jump uh, to how you define after-death communications and then tell us about the different ways messages can come through from the other side. Well, um, our definition is very specific, purposely. Um, An after-death communication, or ADC, is a spiritual experience that occurs when a person is contacted directly and spontaneously by a family member or a friend who who has died. An ADC is a direct experience because no third parties, such as psychics, mediums, therapists, rituals, or devices, are involved. Mm -hmm. And an ADC is a spontaneous event because our deceased loved ones always choose when, where, and how they will contact us. So it's directly, there's no third party involved. It's uh, they come to us. Which eliminates a lot of uh, fraudulent practices. If you're, you know, for f- people are aware of that, then they probably would try to avoid psychics and mediums and the like. Yeah, there's a, a great deal of uh, opinions about that whole field, and fortunately, it's outside of our research, so I don't have to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about the different uh, forms of communication that you've uh, delineated. Well, there are 12, uh, ironically, just uh, 12 major ones, and I don't have time to describe them all, but the most common one, frankly, is feeling the presence, uh, feeling that the person is near you. Then mm-hmm. from there you go to hearing a voice, smelling a fragrance, feeling a touch, or actually seeing them with your, with your eyes. And uh, then there are some other categories, such as when you're asleep, Mm-hmm. And uh, then people uh, write a great deal about symbolic ADCs, where they receive a sign from their deceased loved one. The most common ones involve rainbows or butterflies, but uh, there are many, many, infinitely number of, number of other signs, such as a uh, bird or other animal and its behavior uh, coming to you and acting in a very unusual way that you just know uh, this is a message from someone you love who has died. Mm. As a chaplain, I've encountered many, many people who've told me all, uh, practically uh, all the different uh, delineations you have mentioned. I've been told uh, anecdotally stories about uh, things that they've experienced. And actually myself, I, I encountered the spirit of my mother 
with a very strong smell of roses in the middle of winter when there were no roses around. And, uh, and my father as well at a different time when he, when I smelled his cologne <laughs> just permeating the room and, uh, there was, of course, no one else was there. Interestingly, uh, of all the tw- 12 types, smelling a fragrance is the one that's most commonly shared with two or more people at the same place, same time. Uh, and uh, one person smells it and then another comes along and says, sniffs the air and it says, where is that? Where are the lovely roses or lilacs or whatever it may be or cologne or perfume, something? And another person, another person, on and on and on. So we do have six chapters in the Love from Heaven of why are these real and not merely grief-induced hallucinations. And this is one of the uh, – fits in the one category of shared ADCs. How uh, – is it difficult for people to uh, delineate or to uh, differentiate between – hearing a voice in their head and hearing a voice through their ears? Basically, uh, some people say they hear with their ears, but frankly, I, I believe they all hear it inside their head by telepathy, in other words. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're just so used to saying that, that that's what they believe, because that's the only thing they've ever experienced. Tele- telepathy is something very new and different, and uh, it's only a small category that can claim they heard with their physical ears. Right. Although people who uh, have had near-death experiences often say that uh, they, there's no conversation, it's all it's all telepathic. Yes, that's commu- a, it's very, it's very much alike that way. Mm. Mm-hmm. That takes that kind of communication that takes place from the other side. Yes, and uh, you can have two-way conversations, and some people do. And whole books have been written this way. One of the better known ones right now is the Afterlife of Billy Fingers which is a best-selling book by Annie Kagan, uh, best-selling book at Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. And it's been out for three years and still doing very, very well. It was dictated to her in large part by her deceased brother. Oh. That's just as one book, there are others. Yes. Um, feeling a touch. Now, I I had that happen to me once. Uh, it was a friend of mine who died in the hospital. I was just happened to be sitting in the cafeteria at the time, felt a hand on my shoulder and turned. There was no one anywhere near me, but I knew immediately that it was this person and um, later found out that that was the moment that she had died in the hospital. I didn't even realize she was in the hospital at the time. Yes, there are many ex- uh, experiences that occur where we have the experience first, then we learn of their death afterwards. And uh, we may not learn about it until the next morning um, by telephone or email or something of that nature. But we have the experience first. And I claim people are not bereaved, assuming it's a sudden death, not a, not a long and lingering illness. They're not bereaved uh, in the case of a sudden death like a car accident or a plane crash or something until uh, they, they receive the physical news and uh, whatnot. But when they have someone visit them first and say, I love you, thank you very much for being my friend or whatever, and goodbye. Then they hear about it later that this really did occur, the person did die. Then that's their validation. Now, how how would you differentiate between someone passing through and saying goodbye uh, from uh, people's experiences of ghosts? For instance, what how, what's the difference there? That's another thing. I'm fortunate, and we didn't get into ghosts whatsoever, because we said it had to be a relative or a friend, someone you knew. Uh, occasionally, it is a relative who you didn't know, like such as your husband's uh, mother or father, but it's a relative. Whereas a ghost is usually not identified, and we did not purposely we didn't include ghosts in our work. Nor did we include mediums and mediumship and the psychics and all that because we wanted it to be totally different and new uh, because this is a new field. And so uh, we set our own boundaries. I've talked to people, though, who said, oh, my my grandmother came to visit me uh, and it was sometime after the death. Why would that not be a ghost? Well, as soon as she is, okay, there's a big thing about NDEs, which I've been involved with since 1975, mm-hmm. and uh, we began our research for this in 1988, so 11-year difference there. Uh, and that is when you say ghosts and you use parapsychology and paranormal 
and all these other words. You're del- you're using old language that as soon as they're used, people dismiss it and they don't believe. They stop listening, and that's why we don't use. So nobody said I was contacted by the ghost of my mother. Not one person of the two thousand. 63 or whatever that we interviewed said that. Nobody mm-hmm. uses that kind of language. Nobody says, I had a metaphysical experience with my grandmother, or I had a paranormal experience with my son. I just say, my son came to me. This is the way people talk. It's that there's a big difference between science and psychology, and on the one hand, and this is produ- uh, regarded as something other than and less than real. That's that's unfortunate about all these words like ghost and paranormal and parapsychology and whatnot. And if these NDE researchers would stop using that language, their books and whatnot would be more creditable, I believe. And yet there seems to be lots of evidence, although you know maybe it's a different field of study, but there seems to be lots of evidence that, that there are spirits that seem to have attached themselves to, to this world and don't move on into the light. Uh, and and they get called ghosts. Just. I know. Uh, they, they, <laughs> I, I'm very aware of that. And you see these shows, I call it the flashlight under the chin. And they're on TV, and they go down to a basement in which there's no light, and they're walking around whispering to each other with some big box they're holding in their hand. And they say, here, they look, the needle's moving this way, and this is the antenna's moving that way. And they make it all very, very spooky and eerie, and the audience loves it because they like being scared. But right. these aren't scary. These are uplifting. These are cheerful. These are happy. These are modern-day evidence for life after death. It's all how you want to look at it. Right. Uh, one of the people I've had on this program um, teaches a course in how to have an out-of-body experience. And one of the things that uh, this group does is uh, call it missionary work to spirits who are stuck in this plane They'll go into um, a bar, for instance, and find a ghost that was a, an alcoholic in life and is standing next to a living patron. And as the patron raises a glass to his mouth, the, the ghost imitates the motion, trying to recapture the, the essence of what it was to be an alcoholic on Earth. And well, so they uh, go and, they go and tell him, hey, you, you don't belong here. This isn't where you're supposed to be uh, anymore. Uh, Paul Elder wrote a book on that, Eyes of an Angel, and he, I think, was a graduate of the Monroe Institute, and some of those people do that rescue work. Uh, Rosie McKnight used to be there, and she did it. And I've met uh, probably William Buhlman, has, who's the expert today on uh, OBEs, uh, has probably done some of that. But uh, it, that's different than our field. That's all I'm saying. That's sure. purposeful contact to... Uh, rescue people, save people from being stuck in eternity and, and, and an endless loop tapes, things of that nature. I know right. about it, but that's not my field. Right. Now, one of the categories I think you mentioned is uh, people who have visions of um, of, a, of a loved one. Um, is that? Do you see that as a projection from the other side? Maybe you could give us an example okay, of that. Okay. Well, there are two different uh, categories. One is visual. And literally seeing the deceased loved one, everything yes. from a faint outline on up to a solid to each other as you are and I would be if we were in the same room together. That's visual where you may – now also you may just see their head and shoulders or from the waist up or the knees up. Anything less than seeing the entire physical body we call a partial visual and if, or if they're less than solid. or But if they're fully solid and fully visible, then that's a visual. And those are very cheerful because very uplifting because regardless of the form of death, and keep in mind automobile accidents, battlefield casualties, things like that, um, you don't want to see. But when they come back, they're healed and whole and in radiant health, are usually beaming and smiling at the person with or without communication. And they're letting us know that they're fine and uh, everything's okay. Their physical body is wherever, but they are not that. They're in their spiritual body. Now, a vision, seeing an ADC vision is looking through. It's very hard. There are different categories, but one is just seeing a vision in the room, which I've seen myself, just suspended in space. But other kinds are where you see through this dimension to seeing them in their reality, their dimension. 
and uh, that's what I did with my daughter, Janet. Oh. Uh, could you tell us a little about that? Yes. My daughter took her life at age 47. Um, I won't go, uh, this was, she had attempted suicide a couple of times before. She was very brilliant, very sensitive, very this, very that. But she had gone off cold turkey all of her medications. And I'm sure that she just went into a black hole, a downward spiral into a darker and darker and darker place. And she just couldn't stand it anymore of depression. And for some reason, didn't immediately go back on her meds. But that's what happened. And very impulsively, she ended her life then. But a number of uh, months later, uh, over a year later, uh, I was on my desktop to have the song, Here Comes the Sun, which I identify with her when she was alive. Whenever I heard the song by the Beatles, I would send her sunshine. As it's my a wonderful wife. song. <laughs> you know, picking her up, uh, sending her love. Well, yes. Daddy sending his daughter love. Nothing unusual with that. Only this time I heard the song, and I remembered that her mother built a beautiful website for Janet, in which, much to my surprise and delight, there were many people who had written in saying how much Janet had helped them in their life through all kinds of situations. So here was a young, well, seemingly a young woman who had been troubled herself, reaching out so many times in so many ways and helping others. And I didn't know that about her. Um, it's amazing what parents don't know. Mothers, fathers, even if the children live nearby and you spend a great deal of time with them, you still don't know these other sides of them. And yes. that's what I saw uh, and I got from this experience. But more importantly, I saw Janet. She was turning and also dancing around in a circle. So she was twirling while dancing in a circle, smiling, saying, look, Dad, I'm fine. I'm whole. I'm healed. Uh, everything's okay. And I learned that she's working with children with art. That was her thing, art and drawing and, and uh, painting and everything to do with that and writing books. And she was working on producing huge – you do it mentally. You produce these huge like sculptures, in her case, with children and with their minds. And it's like huge kites that were flying in the air uh, without an atmosphere in this case, but they're moving in the air. Yes. And she was just delighted and happy in letting me know this. And I felt so wonderful for her and her mother and everybody else who is so bereaved by Janet's uh, transition. Of course, that would be a wonderful message to get. Yeah. Uh, have you Now, you guys did more than 3,300 first-hand accounts and interviews with people who've had uh, various um, experiences. Have you ever had one where the person who came back uh, said they weren't happy where they were? We had some who came back to apologize, such as for abusing somebody while they were alive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh but they were always with somebody, interestingly, an angel or Jesus or Mary or somebody. They couldn't come on their own. So if it had been an uncle who abused his a niece, that kind of thing, there was a third party that they came with and received permission to come back and to apologize and hopefully be forgiven by the living person, in which case they were. Yes, there were the, the one that comes to mind the best, it's, it's almost comedic in its own way. Uh, a brother took his own life, and his sister was very concerned about him, and she had an experience in which she saw him, um, not sure while she was asleep or in a, in a vision. It, it really doesn't matter. But she saw her brother wearing an old T-shirt and shorts, and he was in his 20s or upper 20s or so, lower 30s, pacing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and just like, like almost like wringing his hands with despair. And she called out, "What is it? What's what's happening?" And used his name. Let's say Jeffrey. Jeffrey, what's what's wrong? What's what, what's what are you upset about? And he t stopped and turned and looked at her straight on and said, "I've been sentenced." And she went, "Oh, this was a suicide, by the way." But she's a no no according to a lot of churches and all that. Sentenced? She asked. Yes, he replied. I've been sentenced to eternal life. <laughs> now, the one thing you don't want when you take your life is eternal life. You're trying to obliterate yourself. You're right. Trying to end your pain. That's all you're focused on is your pain. And you want to 
under, under most circumstances. There are other things when spies take their life or somebody like that, but um, the ordinary person, and here he is, has this eternal life, but is so confused that uh, this is not what he wants. So, so it was eternal life without eternal light. Yes. In other words, yes, he, he wasn't well, benefiting from God's exactly. God's love. Exactly, oh. yes. That wow. Well, I guess, to that. guess that would be a form of hell. Yes. There now are there's... a lot of people, you know, we speak about life and then uh, after death and hell. There's so many hells on earth. Every battlefield is a hell. Places where people are tortured, uh, places places where people don't have food and water, and they're watching their children starve to death because of mm-hmm. that man's inhumanity to man by not sharing the resources on this planet. On and on and on and on. You can come up with twenty of your own, but th- this life is very much a model of the afterlife mm-hmm. in its own way. Mm-hmm. I believe. Well, as as above, so below, and. Also, I, I actually I've come to believe that this is uh, life on Earth is purgatory rather than it's certainly yeah. not heaven, no. <laughs> and it's not entirely hell either. So no, no, no. I I put us in the middle position. Yeah. Uh, going back to the uh, the third party, do you suppose that every uh, after death communication requires a permission from from God or an angel or something like that? <sighs> Some people uh, ask God for their loved one to be sent back or to be permitted to come back and Mm -hmm. they use that language but frankly i don't think a god is necessary i think the person has to want to and then learn how to and then comes to the person but we also have to be open and some people just are not that open now what's interesting is what we are talking about this whole topic we wouldn't do if we were in central south america parts of europe or especially say in the philippines why because these experiences are so common in those many countries that you have an experience at night with your child, your parent, your brother, sister, whoever it is who died. They come to you. They talk to you. They give you information. You see them. You hear them, all the rest. And then they're gone. And the next day, you share your experience with your friends and family members openly, and easily, publicly. It's, it's no big deal. You can't sell books on this. It's like selling a book on uh, you know, the advantages of driving a car. You, duh. Or having an iPhone. You just don't need it. <laughs> have you, Bill, have you experienced many stories about people having visits from a deceased pet? Uh, yes. We didn't put them in the book. Uh, we thought the book would be too far out if we included children's accounts or or ones where people have pets. But we do have them in our files. The most common, of course, are dogs or cats, but we have one with a bunny rabbit and one with a horse, which died and had to be put put down, and uh, came back with a verbal message which ch- transformed her life because of it. Wow. So, yes, pets come back, and I'd love to say that children, young children, should be believed, but in this country they're not. They say uh, they, they report the presence of or seeing or talking with a deceased relative or friend or somebody they've known. And they're often told, don't talk about that. What will the neighbors think? Or that people think you're crazy or weird. So just, you must have had a dream. It's not real, blah, blah, blah. So we go around telling our children that their own experiences are not valid. Mm. In many I knew a four, four-year-old who... Uh, said he couldn't wait for his uh, little baby sister to be born because he was forgetting what heaven was like and he wanted oh, yeah. to ask her about it. <laughs> I, I, I heard the same thing someplace, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. What sort of child experiences uh, have you heard? Well, there are, t- there are two. Uh, one was a boy. These were all uh, teenage boys. One boy had uh, drowned in a swimming pool, and yet this was a, a boy who was a swimmer, very good swimmer, very, uh, I don't know, but know that he was a uh, lifeguard, but he could have been that kind of kid. I mean, absolutely water safe. And what had happened, how could he have drowned? Nobody could figure it out. And this other boy, who was still physically alive, uh, reported that uh, his friend came to him and explained that, the, that uh, this boy had been running toward the pool and, and uh, meant to sort of like jump into it. Mm-hmm. But he just mistimed his uh, 
footing a bit so that he just grazed the back of his head on the side of the pool and he knocked uh-huh. himself out. And he drowned because he was unconscious for just a short while, but enough to breathe all the water in. But the blow was so slight that even when they did an autopsy, they missed it. It was more of, of just, you know, just being hit very hard in the back of your head. It didn't ab- mm. abrade the skin or cause any bleeding or anything like that. There were no broken bones, obviously. So he was able to shed light on how the boy, his friend, had drowned. That was one. Interesting. And then there are two very long ones. One I won't go into, but there used to be a, a baseball team called the St. Louis Browns. Not the Cardinals, but the Browns. Many, okay. many years ago, back in the 50s. And I don't know where they moved, but they did. And this boy's uncle, I think, was on that team. And he used to visit his son repeatedly, and he informed him about all the players on that team. Now, remember, this is a baseball team that no longer existed for when the boy was being visited by his uncle. But he's mm-hmm. being told about the names of the players, the positions they played, and who was a good batter and who was a good pitcher and all the kind of baseball jargon that the boy didn't know anything about. And uh, later on, when he compared it, it indeed was accurate. And finally, a really good story is a, a, a boy was visited by his uncle who had been a master carpenter. Master carpenter. And uh, even though we didn't put the story in the book, we did the research on it because he described tools that are no longer made or used that this boy knew about because his, his uh, grandfather had described them to him and give him, given them the, the proper name. But when wow. we called Home Depot, there was nobody old enough to remember this kind of equipment <laughs> being available. <laughs> so, I mean, here it's a... very far. I mean, there's much further out stuff than the typical adult. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Bill, you're going to be giving a lecture and at the Orlando IONS conference in July and also teaching a workshop. Uh, maybe you could tell uh, folks if they sign up for this workshop what, uh, what they'll be seeing and, and learning. Okay. My son Chris and I were, well, for many years, Judy and I, and then, uh, were concerned that so many people are bereaved and don't have an experience and they want one so much, so much. And yes, they go to mediums and other things like that. But, but I don't care how many experiences you have or how many mediums you can see, you're still going to be bereaved very difficult, very hard. But still, it's nice to have these experiences. So what we're attempting to do is teach people how to become more open, sensitive, receptive, and able to have ADCs. And we do this with using guided imagery exercises. And we've done two of these courses publicly so far. And people seem to love them. And uh, it's not that people have the experience during the workshop necessarily, some have, but uh, it's really just opening yourself up for the future uh, benefits of being contacted by a loved one who has died. Wow, that's great. Uh, at the end of one of your IONS lectures, you asked the audience, what would the world be like if everyone knew there was life after death? How would you answer that question? Hopefully, be a lot more loving and kind. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I think that's the message that uh, it always comes down to. Uh, Bill, how can listeners get copies of your book, Hello from Heaven? Uh, Amazon dot com has it. Uh, okay. And often uh, it only sells for seven ninety nine, eight dollars or less, and often it's for uh, it's cheaper than that on Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. Occasionally, you can buy it still at Barnes and Noble because it's been out twenty years now. Yeah, uh, a little over. You can 20. get it on Kindle too. That's how I you have, have it. Get it on Kindle. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Bill, I'm sorry to say we're out of time for today. Um, my thanks to you, uh, and uh, th- thanks uh, to uh, your your ex wife Judy for both of your uh, efforts in pioneering research into ADCs and and for sharing uh, your discoveries with us today. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button. Or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can sub- subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.